to say something about uh, the political side or in something else about the political side of being an anthropologist in the 20th and 21st century. Uh, not every anthropologist by any means goes down this path, but as I said earlier when I spoke about the ethical concerns of the field workers in Africa that led to the uh, founding of the Kalahari People's Fund, uh, there are those who feel you can't really sort of just carry your research forward without having a pretty uh, clear vision of the ethical implications of your work and of the field as a whole. So in, uh, just to give you an example, in the 1960s, the United States was escalating the war in Vietnam and sending thousands and thousands of troops to Southeast Asia. 45,000 of them died in the conflict as long, along with perhaps millions of Vietnamese. And in, um, I think it was February of March of 1965, uh, the Department of Anthropology at the University of Michigan uh, uh, held something called a teach-in. And the first teach-in was held by the Department of Anthropology. Uh, and then it spread to other departments and it spread all over, uh, all over North America and the world. There were teach-ins, all-day teach-ins about the Vietnam War in Canada, the US, California, in England, in France, Germany, and so on, where there were classes were stopped and then people just spent 12 hours in an in a auditorium hearing speaker after speaker talking about the uh, Vietnam War and uh, the problems associated with it. So um, it was an era of political ferment and um, I became involved indirectly uh, in, I guess, around 1969 or 70. The, uh, the American Anthropological Association was very active in debating and voting on resolutions to criticize the Vietnam War. And then there was um, a pretty f uh, famous episode when um, a group of UCLA students uh, holding uh, a march, an oppositional march that turned into a building occupation, went into a building, occupied it, which was fairly common during the Vietnam days, and they found in a filing cabinet in an office a set of documents that uh, documented how a certain anthropologist had accepted contracts from the Department of Defense to aid in the war effort in Southeast Asia and to um, bring anthropological expertise to improving the efficiency of the war effort in, uh, in Southeast Asia. These documents found their way to the University of Michigan where two professors, Eric Wolf and Joe Jorgensen, were given possession of these documents. And um, they wrote a paper uh, that was published in the New York Review of Books. I think it came out maybe in 71, something like that. It was called Anthropology on the Warpath in Thailand. And it was a bombshell. It was widely reported in the media that anthropologists had been recruited by the Department of Defense to aid in the war effort, and that these whistleblowers, Jorgensen and Wolf, had uh, exposed the whole plot. So uh, the anthropology community was concerned. Out, some were outraged, but they were all concerned. And so they said, we have to investigate these allegations. So a blue ribbon committee was formed 
by, with uh, Margaret Mead as the chairperson. And the Blue Ribbon Committee was charged with uh, fact-finding and finding out, uh, let's get to the bottom of this. What was going on in the Defense Department, the Anthropology Department? What was going on in these purloined documents that found their way to Michigan? And report back. So uh, a year later, maybe it was, maybe the year was 72, that we had the anthropology meetings I don't remember the year, but anyway, about two weeks before the meeting, or about a month before the meeting, the report, the code known as the Mead Report, came out. And in the report, Mead sharply, and her committee, sharply criticized the anthropologist who had accepted money from the, um, from the Defense Department, and they said, this we should not do. But they were equally critical of Wolf and Jorgensen for taking these stolen documents and using stolen documents to write their article and that was so there was e equal blame on on both sides so I got a call from Eric Wolf uh, in um, I was living in Princeton New Jersey so it have to be like 70 or 71 I got a call from him and he said have you read the have you read the Mead report and I said yes I have he said, how do you feel about it? And I said, I'm outraged. I think it was terrible to sort of make equivalent uh, this major issue of helping in the war effort kill people and this issue of that you accepted these documents. So he said, well, we're going to have a business meeting. We're going to debate the accept this uh, Mead report. Would you be... Uh, would you like to uh, say something, speak about it in the, uh, in the business meeting? I said, I'd be, I'd be happy to. And then we recruited another colleague, uh, a guy named Steve Barnett. So the meeting comes around, and um, the room is packed, uh, and Margaret Mead walks in, and she's the matriarch. She used to come come to meetings in, with a staff that looks like a shepherd's staff, like she was going to part the Red Sea. And she was a very, form, even though she was tiny, she was a very formidable lady. So she comes in and sits down. And the meeting drones on, and we get to the uh, meeting, uh, to the topic on the agenda. And they say, are there any questions or comments about this report? And I, my hand shoots up, and I say... Yes, I would like to speak in favor of rejecting part one of this report. And then I went into my reasons. And there was oohs and ahs, but there were a lot of cheers in the audience, too. And so there was a very, uh, and then Steve Barnett seconded the motion. So uh, they said, well, now the, the motion is up, has been duly moved. Let's have a discussion. And so, uh, some came out in, def uh, in defense of Margaret Mead and said, uh, this is unfair. Mead was, uh, you know, being very even-handed about this, and she certainly didn't excuse the behavior of the people who accepted the money from the Defense Department. And others said, no, you can't make equivalent uh, a terrible wrong and an attempt to correct a terrible wrong. They're not equivalent at all. So... Finally, it was brought to a vote. I said, let's vote on it. And um, the, uh, we expected the thing, the motion would fail, our motion would fail, but at least we had registered our opposition. So um, the motion was called. There were hands on both sides. And I don't remember the exact numbers, but our motion to reject part one of the report passed by an overwhelming majority, like a three to one majority, you know, 500 to one, 400, or 500 to 150 or something like that. Don't remember the numbers. Uh, and so this was like a revelation, you know, that a large majority of the people in the meeting room had, were, had the same uh, opposition that we felt. So we went on to part two and part three, and each one fell, each one was rejected by the membership. And so around halfway through, Margaret Mead 
gets up and marches out with, and then a number of like 20 or so other people march out with Margaret Mead very dramatically, you know. And um, then the rest, uh, the, those who remained quickly rejected the entire report. And so it was, uh, it made the news the next day and the next couple of days that this professional association had rejected a report with the name of America's most distinguished anthropologist on the cover, and it was rejected. So, and it was kind of like a, uh, a revelation that anthropologists were sticking up for, you know, for were protesting in no uncertain terms. And so um, it was one example of a number from that era where anthropologists, unlike other associations like political scientists and economics, uh, were just kind of quietly going about their business. Anthropologists were firm in their opposition to the Vietnam War. I'd like to mention one other name, Kathleen Goff who died in 1990, but back in the 60s and 70s, she was an extremely active uh, opponent of the Vietnam War. And as a result, uh, she, uh, you know, she was much more courageous than the rest of us. So um, she was teaching at the University of Oregon. She later ended up at UBC, or at Simon Fraser. She was teaching at the University of Oregon. And she said, how many of you uh, how many of the men in this room, in this classroom, need to, uh, uh, need to get a, a certain mark out of this course or their grade point will fall to a point where the draft board is going to send them, is going to draft them and send them to Vietnam. So about half the men's hands went up or more than half of the men's hands went up. She said, in that case, I'm going to give everybody an A. I'm just going to give everybody an A. And the University of Oregon fired her. I said, this is unacceptable. And so she and her husband moved to Canada and spent the rest of their lives in Canada. So um, she, this was, anthropology was, a very, was very gutsy in those days. And uh, one of the results of that uh, historic meeting was that we formed ARPA, Anthropologists for Radical Political Action, in the, the following year, and it went on for about 10 years to be a focus for anthropological activism. And then a uh, famous anthropologist from Berkeley, Nancy Shepard Hughes, uh, who is one of the most uh, active, of, wrote an uh, article for Current Anthropology on the Anthropology of Engagement where she said, this is what we have to do as anthropologists. And there were others who wrote against this. She said, no, this would be the end of anthropology because it's got to be value free and it's got to have science as its first. And we can't be swayed by political things. So it was a very lively debate, active debate. And then um, there was a period, I guess in the 80s and 90s, the Vietnam War was over. Uh, the Iraq War had not yet begun. There were still minor uh, US interventions, and anthropologists were always vocal about opposition. But then um, the next uh, f phase in the 2000s, the US Department of Defense introduced something called the, God, I'm just. I think it's called the Human Terrain Project, Human Terrain, which was a very neutral kind of term. And what it meant was that um, Defense Department officials were coming to the anthropology meetings, setting up a booth and saying, we're recruiting anthropologists. We would like anthropologists to come to the Department of Defense and improve warfare. And one of the virtues of the human terrain is that there's, we can, if we can solve a problem without violence, without force, through the use of anthropological knowledge, then don't you think it's really worthwhile for anthropologists to come on board? And so uh, there was, again, 20 odd years later, there were, or more, 
there was a mobilization and there was uh, a pledge circulated that said, I, anthropologist so-and-so, uh, pledge that I will not participate in the human terrain program. And they got over a thousand signatures very rapidly. And so, uh, and there's still, and that human terrain uh, project, uh, the human terrain project sputtered along. I'm sure there were some anthropologists who joined, uh, but then it quietly was shelved around 2010. So that was an example of, uh, you know, the pledge was going to be, uh, uh, have you taken the pledge? And so it was a pretty successful initiative. The next thing that happened is just very recently, it was probably as recently as 2015 or 2015, there was a resolution presented to the American Anthropological Association that there should be an academic boycott of Israeli institutions for their uh, complicity in the apartheid policies of the state of Israel and in the suppression of the Palestinian people. So this was a major initiative and um, it had a very similar uh, outcome to what we had experienced 30 years earlier. Is it maybe 40 years earlier? Because this is 2015 versus 1970. Yes, 45 years earlier or so. And so uh, there was a group of people who introduced this resolution and they said we should uh, have an academic boycott of Israeli institutions for their support of the Israeli war machine and occupation of Palestine. And they specifically said we are not boycotting the individual anthropologists, we're, but we are boycotting the institutions. And uh, the vote was taken, and the vote was something like 1,100 in favor of the boycott and maybe 200 opposed to the boycott. So another sort of lopsided majority. And so I actually wrote an article published a few months ago in Dialectical Anthropology comparing the two, this ancient one from the 70s and this current one from the 2015s, saying, isn't it interesting that very, a lot of parallels here. And so the Anthropology Association said, we've got to uh, submit this resolution to the membership the, by a, in a mail ballot or in an online ballot. So they submitted it, and it was just in March and April of 2016, they submitted it, and the vote was something like 3,025 to 2,090, something like that. Very, very close, but uh, uh, and it was rejected by something like 39 votes. So interesting that uh, 4,500 people, 6,000 people voted, and it was narrowly defeated, uh, th that motion. So I think it's uh, interesting that uh, anthropologists have retained this feisty, and it's interesting that here we are in the, these resolutions were being uh, brought forward in the age of Obama, you know, presumably our most liberal president, and now we have uh, something that's far worse. And so I'm sure that there's going to be a lot of feistiness in the next four years. Uh, so, but it, I think what it brings home to me is that uh, there's something about anthropology which I think attracted me in the first place to um, the discipline because it's got a very, I think, anti-imperialist and even anti-capitalist subtext or anti-capitalist agenda. Why would you go off to the Trobriand Islands if you were completely happy with everything, you know, everything that you experienced in New York or Chicago or Montreal or Toronto? Uh, there must be something that's somewhat 
subversive in a good way about anthropology. And I'm reminded of uh, a famous, uh, one of Levi Strauss's most famous bon mot, which I'll tell me if you've heard it before. He said, an anthropologist is a scholar who sees all cultures as of equal value except his own, which he despises. And, uh, and so he sort of said it out loud, and we all said, no, oh, I guess he's, he's got a point there. So we're, uh, uh, so there's something about the discipline which um, makes me uh, think I made the right choice back in 1956 when I decided to major in anthropology. And, um, and that, that part of it has always, had always attracted me. Uh, the, um, I guess shifting gears again, um, you know, I talked earlier about the, the silos in which the discipline, the subdisciplines of anthropology are increasingly being confined to, and that it's quite different from my early days when an MA in anthropology just necessarily included four subdisciplines. And the history, especially in the post-ethnography era, but even during the ethnography era, there was quite a bit of specialization. And there were valid arguments that say, look, we can't be experts in archaeology and cultural anthropology. We have to, you know, there's an enormous bodies of knowledge in each, and we have to make choices. So I think that's legitimate. And, um, but during, uh, when the age of ethnography gave way to the age of world systems and postmodernism, then uh, the foundations, the theoretical and methodological foundations of the discipline, uh, social cultural anthropology began to sort of get much vaguer and much broader. And so, for example, um, it, you, it, in some circles you say, well, I'm a scientist. I'm an anthropologist and a scientist. Uh, you would get the reaction, oh, come on, don't, don't give me that business about science. You know that science is, uh, you know, deeply flawed and uh, don't hide behind, behind science. And so that's one response. And then there were equally um, strong responses from the other side when uh, you would say, um, gee, I really don't think I can find, say anything definitive about this culture or that culture because it's all open to interpretation and your interpretation may be as good as mine. Uh, the other side might say, now wait a minute, there has to be some way of resolving differences uh, of opinion. We can't just say all, e all, uh, all answers are of equal value. Come on, we have to do better than that. So I can see both sides of the, of the argument. And um, I once did a paper on um, postmodernism where I pointed out that, believe it or not, postmodernists are, even though they claim to reject science and, and say empirical evidence has to be, um, has to be uh, interrogated very carefully, they actually use the same methods that their opponents use to resolve issues. And so if I, uh, uh, just to give you an example, uh, there was a famous example where Marshall Sollins was writing about the death of Captain Cook in Hawaii. And um, Obersikari, a Sri Lankan anthropologist, made the point, oh well, you know, Sollins, he's a white European, you know, so he has, no, he can't really understand the native or the other, the way, uh, you know, he's just bringing his white perspective. 
And uh, whereas I oversee Korea as a person, a persecuted uh, individual from the third world, from the col of the colonized world, I can see, you know, I have a more accurate vision of the, uh, of the, um, the Hawaiians than he possibly could have, which turns out to be uh, pretty, uh, you know, a, a pretty kind of uh, gross exaggeration. And, um, and then, uh, so why do you say what's wrong? What's wrong with Solon's interpretation? Well, because uh, this authority says this and that authority says that. And so uh, I don't think Solon said this. But I would say, well, aren't you using the same methods of empirical, aren't you using the same empirical methods that you're criticizing? You're saying you, your empiricism is better than his empiricism, but you're both empiricists. So this has been, that was sort of my, my argument in this paper, criticizing constructivism. And um, I do admire uh, anthropologists who try to bridge the gap and who are in one discipline but want to talk to people in another, er, another sub-discipline. I'll give three examples. Uh, my first example is an archaeologist at U University of California, Riverside, whose name is Thomas Patterson. He was an expert on the Inca Empire and wrote, and as an archaeologist, wrote many books and articles about Inca archaeology and Inca civilization. And, uh, but he also has a very strong interest in talking to, talking beyond his discipline. So he has written books on the history of anthropology in the United States not just archaeology, but anthropology, uh, looking at the political economy of the U.S. in 1900 uh, and, the, and 1950, looking at the Cold War and its impact on anthropo the history of anthropology. And so he's very much looking at intellectual history uh, beyond his own discipline. The second example is Raina Rapp at New York University, who's a social anthropologist, who some years ago became very interested in genetics and now has done the social study of the field of genetics and especially genetics counseling. And so in order to do this work, she actually went back to school, took genetics courses, and got on a white lab coat and worked in a laboratory uh, side by side with the technicians who were doing the genetic, the genetic analysis. And so she became very knowledgeable about that and crossing directly into a physical anthropology. The third example that I have is a biological anthropologist named Sarah Hurdy, who retired from the University of California, Davis, and whose latest book is Mothers and Others. She started out life as a sociobiologist, a student, in fact, of Irvin DeVore, and uh, has, in the course of her work, has come to see that the selfish gene idea of sociobiology is absolutely wrong when it comes to human evolution. And in her book, Mothers and Others, she presents a revolutionary view of human evolution that says it has to be based on cooperation and sharing. It simply cannot work under these false, uh, what she sees as false, these false assumptions about, uh, about the selfish gene and you can only uh, act in ways that will favor your own genetic, uh, your own genetic uh, propagation. So that's the, uh, those are three examples of people who have made a real effort and she talks to social anthropologists like me and uh, I talk back to her.